Uh, hello and welcome to organizing a Medicare for All webinar. My name is Stephanie Nakajima. I do communications for Healthcare Now, national uh, grassroots single payer organization. Uh, we support grassroots organizing for Medicare for All uh, all over the country and host the annual Medicare for All strategy conference, which this year took place entirely on Zoom for the first time ever. Um, so the information I'll be sharing with you today comes from the experience of holding a totally online conference conference as well as other webinars that we do nationally and locally. So just an overview of what I want you to take away from this training. First is learning how to choose uh, the topic of your webinar, taking a step back and deciding what is the point of doing a webinar, how does it fit into your long-term goals, and how to make sure you've chosen the right topic uh, for your organizing goals and your audience. Second, choosing a platform, whether you want you know, meeting style or more just webinar only, one directional um, style of webinar. Um, then we'll cover all the tasks that go into planning and executing webinar and how to split up those responsibilities. And then finally, how to make sure you actually engage your audience after the webinar is over uh, and then bring those new activists into your organizing work. Uh, so I'm going to go pretty broad today. I'm not going to be able to dive into all the technical aspects as, thor as thoroughly as I would like to. So uh, as we go along, I'm going to be referencing uh, links where you can watch tutorials or learn more about a certain element of the webinars. Um, and all those links will be in this doc, uh, this bit.ly, uh, which you can go ahead and access now if you want or access later for the links. OK. so. Um, quick review of just classic organizing principles. In order to build our power and, you know, make change, we need to do two things. We need to bring new people in who, one, believe in our mission, believe in Medicare for all. Um, and then secondly, uh, people who are going to act, people who are willing to do the work necessary to hold you know, power to account, you know, whether that's our legislators, our institutions, our community groups, our workplaces um, on Medicare for all. So these two things uh, are essential. We need both. Uh, we can't just have people who believe in our mission. Uh, we actually have to have people who are actually going to come together and fight for Medicare for all. Um, and just to drive this point home a little bit, you know, example, for example, the gun control movement has numbers that we in the Medicare for all movement would kill for, right? 95% of Americans uh, believe in background uh, checks on guns in all settings, including uh, gun shows, and more informal settings like that. But we do not have a law passed requiring any such thing. And education isn't actually the problem here. The problem is that the gun control movement has so far failed to actually leverage all that support, this 95% of support into accountability of those in power to fulfill the demands of the 95% of Americans who believe that we should have background checks on guns. Um, and I think many movements, including our movement, the Medicare for All movement is uh, in danger of of this and um, and we just need to make sure that we're we're actually moving people into positions of, of, of organizing roles. So returning to the question of webinar um, to the right here is sort of an example of a ladder of engagement. There's many ways to stratify a ladder of engagement. Um, and these are just some steps to building you know, effective long-term community support. So at the bottom, you have consciousness raising, right? You have awareness, people becoming aware of the problem, learning more about the solution typically. Um, and, and that would be sort of, you know, those bottom rungs. Uh, that's when, you know, the education component where we start making Medicare for all believers. And then the next two rungs, action and advocating, that's where we start to turn those Medicare for all believers into Medicare for all activists. So um, the first question you should start with when planning a webinar is, what is the organizing goal you have that will be furthered by doing a webinar? So why do you wanna do a webinar? Do you want to build your base of activists? 
Uh, do you want to reach out to more people in your area who will take action? Do you want to do campaign work? Running a, are you running a specific campaign? Uh, for example, are you going to use your base of activi activists to move your legislator using a certain tactic? Um, are you going to do coalition work, engaging existing coalition members? Or are you going to do outreach work to specific groups that haven't yet been approached by Medicare for All but would be uh, valuable to have in your coalition? So, you know, once you have your organizing goal in mind, you can decide uh, what kind of webinar you would like to do. So let's get into the types of webinars. Um, I think they kind of generally fall into three categories. So you've got educational, organizing, and training. So um, the first type is like Medicare for All uh, 101 or a Medicare for All related topic. Uh, at intersection with other movements, for example. So um, COVID-19 and Medicare for all. Um, that's, you know, this is, I think we mostly have educational webinars in our movement. For example, this one with like one of our legislative leaders, Representative Katie Porter. Um, so if you're doing an educational webinar, just make sure that you're not preaching to the choir. Ensure that you're actually, you know, reaching a new audience that would benefit from hearing this information so that you can build awareness that will, you know, lead to action. Um, so, you know, if you've set up an educational webinar and only your base shows up, the people who are already on your email list have already said, yes, I wanna receive updates on the fight for single pair, then you should have been doing an organizing webinar. So how do you make sure that you're doing an educational webinar that will actually reach new people? So if you just send out a blast to your mailing list, then the chances are you're gonna end up with the same people, the people that you should be sort of moving up the next rung of the ladder of engagement, right? And moving them into activist roles. So, you know, what you wanna do, I think, is partner with a group where there is buy-in, right? A community group, a faith group, um, a professional organization, if you're a doctor's group, for example, and get their members to show up and then tailor the presentation towards how um, Medicare for All would affect that group, right? So how would Medicare for All, for example, how would Medicare for All affect you as a public school teacher? Um, and so uh, I think that that's a great way of um, using educational webinars to do coalition work and bringing uh, more groups in that will need to win into a Medicare for All coalition. Um, and I think most webinars in our movement are, are purely educational, which is important, but people need opportunities to organize, right? So the next two types of webinars um, that I wanna talk about are kind of organizing related. So the first one is just sort of regular old campaign style organizing webinar. And in, an, in such a webinar, there may be a portion dedicated to education on the urgency of the issue, but primarily the point of this is to plug people into um, a, a campaign that your organization is running. Um, so the bulk of the presentation is gonna be just like an overview of the campaign and then a concrete ask where you can actually uh, pitch uh, your campaign work to uh, the people in attendance. So an example of an organizing webinar uh, would be like a kickoff, you know, kickoff event for uh, lobby day. So um, that's that's a pretty typical use of an organizing webinar just to get more people involved in your current campaign. And it's just the a best way to engage your base who is already committed to Medicare for all, um, as well as bringing in others uh, who find the webinar on social media, who are already educated on Medicare for All and who are ready to actually do work. Um, and that's a great way to sort of like skip one step uh, when you've got, you know, an action oriented webinar. Um, I find that people are really responsive to that because they do wanna find ways to, to plug into real work. Um, and so that's another sort of advantage of an organizing webinar is that there's a promise of, um, of community around doing an action. And this is of course the right next step for people uh, you've already had go through an educational webinar, right? So you're moving them up the ladder. Right, so an, you know another example uh, would be 
how can I organize my, you know, community, hospital, or profession for Medicare for all? You know, so if you're not really sure, um, you know, what kind of webinar you want to do, first just take a step back and look at your current campaigns, or it might be a time to think about like what kind of campaigns you're running um, and how um, easy it is for your base to actually get plugged into that campaign. If there are roles available um, for people to really uh, participate in the campaign. If they're not, you may actually even want to rethink your whole campaign. So the next kind of webinar, I would say this is like a training webinar, which is a webinar to teach a specific skill. So, you know, as with an organizing webinar, there may be a portion dedicated to education on the urgency of an issue, um, but primarily the bulk of the webinar is going to be to teach people a new skill. Um, and then, of course, a concrete ask, usually a way to use those skills. Um, and this is also um, a great time to sort of use breakout rooms, uh, which you can do in Zoom meeting uh, for skills practice. So like an, uh, an organizing webinar, it's also a great way to kick off an organizing campaign uh, or get more people involved in your current organizing um, and a great way to engage your, your, your current base. So an example is bird, how to bird dog for Medicare for All. So this is a webinar that we did last year and we did it in uh, uh, together with the Center for Popular Democracy and we sort of both brought our crews there and we, you know, helped to solidify the ties between our organizations. Um, you know, we, uh, we both have like slightly different angles on organizing and, and so it's really good when we, um, when we do things together so that there can be some like intermingling of our organizations and our theories of change. So, so to recap, um, we just looked at three different types of, of webinars. When you're deciding on a webinar topic, you wanna first look at your organize, organizing goals. Do you have a lot of committed Medicare for all activists who need to be moved up the ladder of engagement into action? Um, I would definitely, you know, use your educational webinars to bring in new people um, and new coalition partners in, but don't get stuck at the bottom steps, the, the learning and awareness forever. Um, we want to definitely activate the people who we've educated so that they, they can um, affect change on Medicare for all. Okay, so let's get into some of the technical aspects. You know, there are many webinar platforms now that have proliferated with COVID, right? But, um, and maybe this is kind of a boring suggestion, but my recommendation is to keep it simple and just use Zoom. Um, so why just use Zoom? Uh, Zoom actually has quite a lot of functionalities. 99% of the time it's gonna meet your needs. Um, most people, especially older people, um, are familiar with Zoom. They've got it already downloaded on their computer. If they click a Zoom link, it's gonna open on their phone or on their computer. Um, and so it's sort of, in some ways, the path of least resistance to just use Zoom. Um, and then there's price considerations. So Zoom webinar and Zoom meeting is only $15 per month, um, which is pretty good as far as this industry is concerned. Many of these other webinar services, Click Meeting and GoToWebinar, are quite a bit more expensive. Some are like, I think GoToWebinar is like $50 a month. And then they don't really offer much more than activists would probably need. I think Zoom webinar will go up to like a thousand attendees. Um, and I think a Zoom meeting is quite a number as well, or you can like pay for a certain number more than that. And um, and I don't think that we, even for the, the Medicare for All strategy conference where we had a thousand, over a thousand people signed up, we, um, I don't think that we really ever hit the, the, the cap. Um, so that's sort of my recommendation. I mean, um, if you have any other suggestions on platforms, then please share in Slack and, you know, would love to have a conversation about that. Um, and because I'm, I'm sort of just going to go over Zoom and not spend too much time on platforms, um, but would love to hear from y'all on what your preferred platforms are. So 
But with Zoom, you know, you're going to have two options, basically, a Zoom meeting and Zoom webinar. So there's they are actually two totally separate subscriptions. And, you know, we're about to get into the differences, but I think you're mostly likely want to use Zoom meeting. So Zoom webinar is designed for like really large audiences or where, you know, you really don't need to see other people. It's very like one way street. Um, so for the Medicare for All conference, we used Zoom webinar for the big plenary sessions where it was, you know, like one or two or, you know, a panel of four people speaking. And then we used a Zoom meeting for all the workshops. Um, and that made sense because we had like a thousand people in the plenaries and then more like 50 to 100 people in the workshops. Um, and, you know, before we move on, I just want to remind everybody that, you know, since I'll be spending less time going over the actual technological aspects. Um, I did include a lot of links in the guide that go over the, all the aspects of setting up and running a Zoom meeting, which you can refer to when you're you know, actually ready to set up your webinar. So this is a little bit what Zoom meeting looks like. Um, in Zoom meeting, everyone on the call is gonna show up. <laughs> um, the viewer gets to choose what screen they see. So you know whether they have the active speaker view or the gallery or whatever. Um, however, as the host, you can sort of simulate a Zoom webinar uh, where you just see like the one big screen and then there's like a little sort of panel of like three or four uh, of the attendees on the side. Um, by, and you do that by doing a screen share. So sort of like what I'm doing right now. So that will bump out most people to just a couple squares on the side and then most of the screen will be whatever the presenter is sharing. And that I think has typically worked. So a little bit more about the meeting. Um, again, the viewer chooses the screen, but you can, you know, kind of get around that using the screen there. The other thing that's cool about Zoom meeting is breakout rooms. Um, you can assign them randomly or, you know, by, by however many people are in each. So you can break out a group of 50 people into 10 groups of five, and then they just randomly are assigned to a room. Or you can build the rooms yourself with the people that you want in each. Um, and then it's just generally more interactive uh, than Zoom webinar. So you can do polling, um, you can do one-on-one -on -one chats in the chat. Um, and then the thing that it doesn't have that Zoom webinar does have is like a specific broken out question and answer function. So in Zoom webinar, you know, people can ask questions in a separate stream that's only seen by the hosts. Um, and so the host can look at all the, the questions that are coming in. But this doesn't mean that you can't do a Q&A in Zoom meetings. Um, it's just generally done in chat. Um, and I think that that typically works, especially if you have less than like 500 people or something in your, in your webinar. Um, and then, of course, Zoom meeting has a limited free version, but you can only meet for 45 minutes. <laughs> so I would definitely recommend getting a subscription. Um, and then Zoom webinar um, is what we use, again, what we use at the, the Medicare for All Strategy Conference for the, the big plenary sessions uh, where we had just like one person on the screen or the panel. Um, and so you'll need this if you only want the presenters on screen and to keep like basically everybody else off screen. Um, though again, this can be done with a screen share and Zoom meeting. Yeah. Um, and again, there's no breakout rooms in Zoom webinar, no polling, that kind of stuff. So the similarities between these two, um, Zoom webinar and Zoom meeting, is that you can live stream both. So that's not a concern to both YouTube and Facebook. And of course, you can do screen sharing with both. Um, just a word on the breakout rooms. Uh, I think breakout rooms can go really well or poorly. Um, the feedback that we got on the conference, um, you know, some people said they had really good conversations going in the breakout rooms and they wish they had more time to spend with the group that they had. Um, and they felt like that were some of the best parts of the conference for them. And then others felt that they were kind of unfocused or unproductive. Um, and so it really kind of depends on, you know, what is the makeup of the room. And so uh, you know, if we had had the capacity to do this, we probably would have had someone there um, to act as a moderator. So to make sure that nobody in one in any particular group is monopolizing the conversation, or if the group has a hard time staying on track with the questions that they were asked, um, you know, 
that can make a breakout room less fun. So a moderator could just keep the discussion focused. So my suggestion would be, you know, if it is possible to assign a moderator to each breakout room to ensure that everyone has a fair chance to talk, conversation stays on topic, I think that creates a better breakout room experience. Um, okay, so um, just a couple things on structuring, you know, the webinar. You know, I think that webinar should be max one hour. Uh, it's their Zoom fatigue is real. Um, just looking at people in the eyes like that, so close up with their face. Um, that's actually that's actually a real documented phenomenon <laughs> that that does make people more tired than they would be in an in-person meeting. Um, sometimes I think a training webinar um, in particular could go on longer than an hour, but you would need to build in like stretch and bathroom breaks um, to give to give people time away from the computer. Um, and I think the big mistake that a lot of presenters make is that there's not enough time for interaction from the audience. And I would say, you know, use only 50% of the time. So that's 30 minutes max of the time total for a presentation and stick with it because there is definitely going to be an urge to go over. Um, and the other 50% should be an interactive portion. It should be for Q&A. It should be for the ask. Um, and uh, yeah, or it should be like breakout rooms. And then you want to create a really strict schedule. So, and by that, I mean like a minute to minute schedule, like at 8.02, we start, you know, 8 o'clock to 8.02 is just like, getting settled. 802 is when we introduce the webinar. 804 is when we ask people to put their name in the chat or whatever. Um, so to, to ensure that your schedule stays on time, you want to make sure your speakers know exactly when they are speaking and for exactly how long. Um, and then, of course, you want to plan the ask. What kind of ask? Is it an organizing ask, signing up for a campaign, committing to make a phone call? Who is going to do the ask? have a link to the ask and put it in the chat uh, as well as on a slide um, and then follow up afterwards and we'll talk about all of that in a bit. Okay, so webinars, there is actually quite a lot of work that goes into a successful webinar and it shouldn't only fall on one or two people to pull it all together. Um, you wanna bring volunteers in, ideally a team of at least four people who do four distinct roles and who can take on the following designated responsibilities according to their skill sets. Um, and I sort of identify them as technical coordinator, marketer, presenter, and moderator. So first is the technical coordinator. So this is some a volunteer who can handle the technical side, including the setup of the, uh, the registration um, and, and the webinar itself. Uh, the co somebody who can manage while the webinar is happening, the co-hosting and give co-hosting responsibilities, can set up the live streaming. Um, you know, so one of the things would be like, um, and I have a link to this actually in the in the um, the doc that I shared in the Bitly. Um, you want the setup, you want the event to require registration. Um, you don't want to just like give the link out. To, to anybody. This allows you to sort of stay in contact with your attendees after the meeting is over. It's actually one of the main uses of a webinar is to build your base. Um, the second thing is that the technical coordinator should be uh, responsible for recording the webinar if you decided to record. Um, third is handling the technical aspects of the webinar. So, you know, you're going to have a waiting room and you want to let in, in attendees from the waiting room when you're ready um, and you want somebody separate to do that because if the presenter is also having to like look for uh, attendees who are coming in late from the waiting room then that's going to be very distracting as they're talking. Um, this person will also be muting panelists or those with background noise, um, assigning others as co-host, troubleshooting attendee issues <laughs> of which there will certainly be some, um, and doing things like throwing out zoom bombers so I don't um, for those of you unfamiliar with Zoom bombing, uh, those are trolls who sort of just drop into um, webinars. Even the, those that have required registration, they you know they sign up and then they get in and then they attend just to disrupt the meeting or shock people. Um, and again, I have a link 
in the dock with some settings to be aware of to minimize to minimize or deal with Zoom bombing. Um, and then they're going to be responsible for uploading that recording and whatever post-production goes into that, however much post-production you want to do, um, basically the next day. Okay. Next is a marketer. So someone who's going to announce the webinar, send reminders, promote on social, get the word out about your webinar. Um, so again, it's really important to distribute the Zoom meeting link only to those individuals who will be attending your webinar. Um, if you share the meeting link itself on social media or other public platforms, anyone who sees the link will be able to join. And so forcing people to sign up at least creates an extra level of security to get the link. Um, then they're going to be responsible for the calendar of reminders. So seven to days, seven to ten days before you want to announce your webinar through email and social media channels, um, and then you know kind of create a Facebook event for the webinar that links through to the re registration page, um, and then you want to also send day before and day of, preferably uh, on the day of one hour before the start of the webinar, uh, reminders through all those channels that I just mentioned. And plus text message, if you have text message capacity, because people get their text messages much faster than they get their um, emails. So um, if you're doing education, an educational webinar, or you're just doing even an organizing webinar, partnering with another group, you want to provide that group easy to use copy for email and social well in advance so that they can do the same blasts. Um, you want to just make it as seamless and easy for them to reach uh, their membership about this webinar um, because that will improve the odds that they will actually reach out to their membership if you've done a lot of the work for them. Okay, so that's the marketer's role. Next is the presenter. So the one, the, the person or the people who speak to the audience, you know, give the presentation, deliver the information. Um, so for the presenter, you want to let the audience know in the introduction how you'll be dealing with questions, like whether you'll respond to select at the end or try to take them during the session. Um, I sort of prefer to do it the second way, but either way, I think it's, um, even if you do it the first way where you just take all the questions at the end, it's a good idea to address individuals who are posting during the talk, um, if, if you can do both things at one time. Sometimes it's a little difficult to give a presentation and also uh, keep up with ha what's happening in the chat, but that helps to increase engagement and sort of a sense of two-way communication. And then you definitely want to use like a PowerPoint for visual interest. Let's be real, I have not done a great job of creating visual interest <laughs> for this uh, PowerPoint, but um, you know, it should at least not be a script of your talk. It should just be sort of short bullet points. Um, if you want to provide something for the audience to read later, like create a more texty document like the bit.ly, um, rather than sharing the slides, which aren't don't really have a lot of information, um, you know, so the, the doc is actually a lot better because it's going to sort of flesh out everything you were actually talking about in the, um, in the presentation instead of trying to smash it all into the slides. Um, and then plus whatever other handouts or materials used, you can also add that to your to your link. And technical tip for the presenter, if you have notes you need to read, you can actually share your screen in presenter view for the audience and still see your own, your notes on your screen without the audience seeing that. Um, and it's actually a little bit complicated um, whether you are using Windows or Mac. Um, and I have links to how to do both of those in the doc. Um, so check that out if you're the presenter and you, you want to be able to do that. Um, and I would practice doing it beforehand because it's a little it is a little confusing. Um, and the technical coordinator, if you as the presenter don't feel like you can do that, uh, the technical coordinator can also do this for you if you want to send them your presentation. And then, you know, you can have your notes and they can click the slides. Okay. Mm, number four is the moderator role. Um, this person is the schedule keeper and sort of keeps the webinar moving, flowing from section to section. Um, it, they're going to start the webinar, they're going to introduce the presenters, um, they're going to 
you know, facilitate the Q&A. They're going to close everything out. Um, my tips for the moderator would be don't wait too long to start. Just two minutes past the start time. I wouldn't do a whole five minutes. You want to get stuff going already. Um, and especially because if you start late, then for the next webinar, people are going to anticipate that you're going to start later. And then there's going to be even more that's going to like push the whole thing back. Right. So you want to have like a rep build a reputation for starting pretty on time. Um, the other thing would be to engage the audience in the chat. So you want to have people introduce themselves in the chat, like who they are, where they're from, why they came to what they wanted to get out of this webinar. Um, can even do a poll, get people interacting, just get people interacting and excited from the beginning. Um, and yeah, of course, support presenters with introductions. You want to keep time. Um, so you want to, what I usually do is like I send a private chat to speakers who are going over. Sometimes I see them, sometimes they don't. Sometimes I'll send a text message. Um, at least you tried. Um, and then, of course, facilitate Q&A. Um, the moderator typically should choose the best questions, um, keeping tra track of the chat, um, or the most asked questions. Hopefully they're the same. Okay. And then finally, you want to follow up after uh, the webinar because that's how you're going to make sure that uh, all your attendees are actually going to complete the actions, steps that you've given them um, and getting them more sort of involved in your organization, right? So you're going to immediately within 24 hours follow up with the ways to take action um, if you're doing an educational webinar um, or an action webinar. Um, and then send out the recording and the slides to people within, I would say, 24, 48 hours if possible. Um, upload that recording to YouTube or wherever you want to host it. And then you know tell them during the webinar that you're going to do this so that they know to anticipate it. So you know many of your attendees are going to email you asking for that info anyway. And so just you know you want to have like a plan to send it out. And definitely fast follow up helps you motivate people to take the next step while the webinar is still on their mind. Yep, so um, that was that. I hope this was useful and please engage uh, in the Slack if you have any questions or comments. Love to hear also your best tips uh, for, for doing a webinar or whatever questions you might have. Everybody.